You won't see this coming. Even though SpaceX confirmed that no metallic heat shield tiles were installed on Ship 38 during Starship Flight 11, those familiar oxidation streaks still showed up on the hull after landing, just like Flight 10 did. And Elon Musk's explanation? It made everything perfectly clear. So, what exactly did he say about the thermal protection system? Let's dive into today's episode of Alpha Tech. During the countdown for Starship Flight 11, SpaceX shared a rare behind-the-scenes look at how they make Starship ceramic heat shield tiles and how many they produce. The process is surprisingly similar to making pizza. First, they mix and shape silica dough into molds, then bake it in a high-temperature oven. Then, a black thermal coating is added, like putting toppings on your pizza before it goes into a giant kiln for a second bake. But here's the twist. Turning raw material into a finished hexagonal ceramic tile takes up to 40 hours, and at full capacity, SpaceX can produce 7,000 tiles a day. That means in less than three days, they can churn out enough tiles to build a complete thermal protection system for a Starship, which requires roughly 18,000 tiles. Once installed on the vehicle, these tiles face another intense test. One or more high-temperature bakes during flight in the harshest kiln imaginable, space itself. Take Flight 11 yesterday as an example. After successfully deploying Starlink satellites, the Starship began its descent and entered the most dangerous phase, re-entry. At this point, the vehicle is basically flying through a scorching furnace. Even a small mistake, like a pressure fluctuation or unexpected vibration, could spell disaster. Yet, Flights 10 and 11 showed just how precisely SpaceX can control Starship during re-entry, and this newly released footages from Flight 11 makes that even clearer. The vehicle entered the atmosphere at roughly a 45-degree angle, maximizing atmospheric drag before gradually leveling out and performing a spectacular flip maneuver. Moments later, its Raptor engines reignited, guiding the vehicle into a perfect soft splashdown, a breathtaking display of precision and engineering. And if you're wondering why this phase is often called the furnace, just look at Ship 38. Before reaching this stage, brilliant plasma streams begin to form around the vehicle, created by friction with high-speed atmospheric molecules. These glowing ions light up in shades of yellow, red, and pink, wrapping the spacecraft in vivid, fiery colors as it plunges through the atmosphere. These colors actually reveal the energy and temperature of the plasma, influenced by the chemical composition of the atmosphere and re-entry conditions. Yellow usually appears when the plasma reaches extremely high temperatures, around 10,000 to 15,000 Kelvin, caused by strong ionization of nitrogen and oxygen molecules, emitting light at shorter wavelengths. Red or pink, on the other hand, indicates lower temperatures, roughly 5,000 to 10,000 Kelvin, often from emissions of nitrogen or oxygen in lower energy states, or from the presence of other elements like hydrogen. No wonder, after the flight, Elon Musk shared a rare comment about Ship 38. The heat shield tile is insanely hot. Yes, these ceramic tiles are built to protect the Starship from extreme heat, but plasma temperatures can be way beyond what the tiles are designed to handle. Made from silica ceramics or advanced ceramic composites, the tiles are rated to withstand surface temperatures up to about 1,650 degrees Celsius, or roughly 1,923 kilocalories, which is far lower than the peak plasma temperatures during re-entry. The good news is that the super-hot plasma doesn't transfer all of its heat directly to the tiles. The ionized gas around the ship acts like a natural thermal barrier and the tiles themselves are optimized to reflect, absorb, and dissipate heat efficiently. If a ceramic tile gets enveloped in plasma for too long, the intense thermal pressure can cause minor ablation, essentially some surface material vaporizing, especially if there's a flaw in the tile. But SpaceX designs these tiles to survive such extreme conditions without being destroyed. As the plasma cools and shifts to red or pink, the thermal load drops, easing stress on the heat shield. Still, the tiles must maintain their mechanical integrity through repeated thermal cycles. These color changes reflect rapid temperature swings, essentially testing the tile's resistance to thermal shock and cracking. If any tiles are damaged, cracked, or chipped, they can be easily replaced thanks to SpaceX's modular design, keeping the Starship ready for the next flight. However, this still doesn't meet SpaceX's insane launch cadence goals. 
They're aiming for a material that can survive a flight without needing replacement or repair. They tried metallic heat shields, but those failed. Metal oxidizes far too easily during re-entry. The clearest example is Ship 37. SpaceX installed three hexagonal metal tiles as a test, but they quickly underwent oxidation, forming the characteristic orange-red rust layer. This oxide didn't just stay on the test tiles. Some of it vaporized, condensed, and spread to nearby tiles, effectively staining the entire lower hull. The effect is clearly visible in footage captured from a buoy near the landing point in the Indian Ocean. That's exactly why metallic heat shields were immediately scrapped from testing. But here's the interesting part. During Flight 11, Ship 38 wasn't fitted with any metallic tiles, yet a similar effect appeared. The difference? The rust didn't spread as widely, and instead of the bright orange color, it showed up as a more subtle brown. The reason is actually quite simple. In its latest Flight 11 update, SpaceX explained, Starship re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and was able to gather extensive data on the performance of its heat shield, as it was intentionally stressed to test the limits of the vehicle's capabilities. That stress came from removing a few heat shield tiles, and in some areas, they didn't even add secondary white thermal protection, exposing the stainless steel underneath. Elon Musk added, the rocket came back from space at hypersonic speed and then hovered at a precise position. During re-entry, Ship 38 reached speeds from Mach 5 up to Mach 25, and the plasma didn't just interact with the heat shield, it licked the exposed hull as well. On these exposed stainless steel areas, temperatures exceeded 1,000 degrees Celsius. Even though 304L stainless steel, a low-carbon austenitic steel known for excellent corrosion resistance thanks to its high chromium and nickel content, handles corrosion well under normal conditions, such extreme heat still triggers oxidation. That's what produced the brown residue seen in images, explaining why rust appeared even without any metallic heat shield being tested. Now that the final flight of version 2 has come to an end, it'll probably take at least a few more months before SpaceX is ready for the next Starship launch. They're now preparing for even bolder goals next year, reaching orbit, demonstrating an orbital refilling, and catching the upper stage using the giant chopsticks of the launch tower. Recently, when a fan directly asked Elon on X about when the tower will actually catch the ship, he replied with just one word, springtime. That means sometime between March and May next year in Texas, possibly during the second or third launch at Starbase's Pad 2. Of course, that's just speculation. But this timeline could arrive much sooner, depending on when the first flight of Starship version 3 takes place. And if you're wondering how close that might be, well, SpaceX may have already given us a big clue. When the countdown clock showed just 14 hours before Flight 11's liftoff, something unexpected happened at Starbase. Right at the Star Factory, observers spotted the very first version, three nose cone, belonging to Ship 39, being rolled out of the building. The sight took everyone by surprise, because this section already appeared almost fully equipped with the new ceramic heat shield system. Its backside was covered in a glossy black coating, although the Pez door was still missing, temporarily held in place by two welded metal braces to prevent structural deformation. And just below the Pez door, two strange protruding tubes immediately caught everyone's attention. At first glance, some thought they might be small maneuvering thrusters, similar to the Draco engines on Dragon. But in fact, this mysterious hardware is part of a system designed to enable orbital refilling, a critical capability for Starship's future long-duration missions. Here's how it works. After docking, the two Starships align and connect through a pair of extendable ports. Once a secure link is established, automated valves open, allowing flexible umbilical lines to form a sealed path between the propellant tanks of the tanker and the receiving vehicle, whether it's a depot or the HLS variant. There are two separate lines, one for liquid oxygen at around minus 183 degrees Celsius, and another for liquid methane at about minus 162 degrees Celsius. Both lines are vacuum insulated to prevent freezing or leakage during transfer. The process relies on a pressure differential, or pressure delta. The tanker slightly increases the pressure inside its tanks, either by injecting helium or by using small turbo pumps to push the propellant through the umbilicals. The pressure difference is typically around 1 to 2 bar, enough to maintain smooth flow without causing cavitation or overpressure. 
In the early phase of operations, no complex pumping system is needed. The propellant can flow naturally, aided by the microgravity settling effect, created by gentle rotation or attitude control. A method first studied by United Launch Alliance in their settled propellant transfer experiments. The sequence usually prioritizes LOX transfer first, since it's more volatile, followed by methane. Each refilling session may last 30 to 60 minutes, transferring roughly 100 to 200 kilograms per second of propellant. Overall efficiency is estimated at 80 to 90 percent, with boil-off losses around 1 to 2 percent per tanker. Once refilling is complete, the two transferred nozzles retract back into their housings, the umbilicals disconnect, and the tanker prepares for its return to Earth. In general, the appearance of Ship 39's new nose cone marks the beginning of what could be a major leap forward for Starship's future. However, its first flight might not go fully operational just yet. SpaceX could instead opt for a controlled splashdown in the ocean, a cautious move to ensure safety, since every new version brings sweeping changes to both the hardware and the flight software. According to the roadmap, SpaceX plans to master the Starship catch before moving on to orbital refilling, and if that catch succeeds, it will represent nothing short of a revolutionary breakthrough. This single achievement could lay the foundation for a new era of space travel, one where rockets can be rapidly reused, dramatically lowering the cost of access to orbit. In that future, the launch cost of a fully reusable Starship could drop to just $2 to $10 million per flight, compared to the hundreds of millions required for expendable rockets today. Beyond cost, the impact extends all the way to NASA's Artemis program, which chose Starship as its lunar lander to carry astronauts to the moon later this decade. Successfully catching and reusing Starship would demonstrate a system capable of landing and taking off repeatedly on the moon, without the need for massive infrastructure like SLS, significantly reducing risk for crewed missions.